Hello, everybody, from our Network Defense and Countermeasures 2611. This is Scott Scheidt just saying hello to everybody and pulling up the slide deck for this week's material. So this week, uh, Chapter 2, TCP IP. So overall, fundamentals of TCP IP will be reviewed. We're going to talk about and go through uh, a lot of information on the IPv4 and IPv6 structures and what the value is to both of them and why we even need a IPv6 since we had four for so long. The basic structure for what we're dealing with in this lesson is associated with the OSI model and the TCP IP protocols, which is a suite that facilitates network communication. That network communication runs through what we call the stack. And the stack goes through basically all seven layers of the OSI model. The OSI model breaks out the communications in the network by functions. As you can see here, from application to presentation down to physical, takes us all the way through how a piece of data or a set of data travels through a communications network to be uh, carried, rendered, identified, authenticated, secured, routed to the correct location, uh, verified, and then at the application layer rendered for someone to be able to uh, use that communication. So some of you may have heard of some of the protocols we're going to talk about here, HTTP, standard website. If you ever went to put in a www dot website, uh, there are times when you would want to put the HTTP in front of it, especially if you're trying to make sure you're going to the secure version of a site. Your domain name system, your DNS, is where uh, translation is done between the actual name that is rendered for the site versus its uh, numeric name. We'll talk about that. You guys read about that, learn about that. You have a difference between uh, private IP address ranges and uh, public IP address ranges. That goes into uh, DHCP, where, where how things are, are passed along. Your file transfer protocol is associated with sending usually large files. You guys had Google or something, see so it says uh, something larger than 25 megabytes needs different uh, handling. That's usually through the FTP protocol. Telnet kind of deals with things related to the telephone or telephony or uh, voice over IP. Then your IMAP, SMTP, POP, that's kind of the protocols associated with email. Uh, communications moving through the network. For your IP addresses, this is how a computer is identified. So even though you are connected with a computer name of, let's say, Scott's desktop, that's just for my reference. In the connection of the world, there's an actual uh, binary IP address that associates that device. The network layer of the OSI model is where that is processed. So as you can see, 32-bit address for IPv4 divided into four groups called octets. And then those octets uh, contain eight bits of data. So as you see there, starting with the one, you have eight bits of data 
in each of those. And so if you added all that up, you're going to get 32 bit address. Binary is converted to a dotted decimal notation, as you see there. And so in the OSI model, as the, as the data flows through the stack, it's translated uh, by the DS into and out of www.mcdonalds.com that you that you type into the search browser or the search engine. It actually goes out and finds the binary uh, version of that, and then that's what it is looking for when it sends something back to you. It sends it back in our words, but it's still got the underlying IP address associated with it. So the network identifier is shared among computers in the network segment. The host address is unique to each computer on the network segment. Then you got the subnet mask, and that's used to identify which part of the IP address is the network identifier and which is the host identifier. So attackers will gain access to a network by determining the IP addresses of computers and then uh, exploiting what type of ports or activities or applications uh, are running or associated to that. IP addresses should be concealed to prevent uh, many different attacks and you don't have to broadcast your IP address uh, inside of a network, an organization network, or even your home network. So running a port scan, which will this, if not one of the overall cybersecurity classes, but running a port scan will allow a threat actor to identify open ports to exploit. And the ports associated to what type of traffic will be able to, to move across it. I'll see if I send you a, uh, like a port list from like the Security Plus um, certification course. So you can kind of see what we're talking about. There's way more ports uh, moving information and, and uh, data around than what anybody realizes. When I first saw it, when I took a Security Plus training, it, it kind of blew my mind a little bit to see how much stuff is moving at one time. But uh, network address translation is an example of how we go about uh, hiding or camouflage. So you have what's called a private network's internal address, and that gets converted into external addresses that can be used in the public internet. So the uh, IP address that is floating around for your computer on the internet is not the actual IP address of the computer. It's a translated one from private to public. As you see the note there, private networks internal addresses are not routable on the internet. So overall, we ended up from uh, IPv6, or excuse me, IPv4 to IPv6 because people in the design phase of, of the protocols to start with didn't think we would ever run out of IP addresses. But if you can imagine today uh, between smartphones, devices, IoT devices, tablets, uh, you know, vehicles, and every website that's out there, uh, IP addresses have started to become in short supply. And even though that was known with IPv4 as a potential, it was not thought. And at the time, there was not a vision of exactly where we would be right now. So IPv6 protocol expanded on that and has truly taken us to an almost what we would call infinity exponential uh, ability to um, to associate IP addresses with device and activity needs. <clears throat> so that's why we have the different ones, four versus six. 
they look different. They're set up a little bit different. You'll see in this class and as we go forward, uh, understand why and how they're, they're manipulated or uh, attacked by threat actors. So we got address classes determine the number of its networks compared to a number of hosts. So the hosts are the in-state uh, machines or devices such as your desktop, your smartphone that's connected to a network, a uh, device of any kind, anything that needs to connect to that network and transmit or receive data as a part of that network is going to have an IP address associated to it. So you got your classes, class A through class E. So it's going to take you through the first octet, the decimal range. Your default subnet mask is next. And then here's an example of the purposes for what the different ones based on the classes. So usually uh, large corporations and government are operating on class A IP addresses all the way down to uh, medium networks. And medium networks could still even be, you know, uh, even as large as you know, huge cities and, and states, small networks take us down into uh, small businesses, uh, even even very large small businesses. And then class D IP addresses are for multicasting. And so we can get into, <laughs> excuse me, um, the difference between even casting, multicasting, and broadcasting. Uh, so that's those type of castings are usually in a class D line. So if you're talking about streaming, for example, which is huge now, you're talking about uh, streaming TV, gamers, streaming activities, or even uh, the streaming of uh, security footage, videos, uh, any type of, of of casting of the data from one place to the next or from it needing to be uh, accessed or monitored in real time where we're getting uh, into the multicasting class D. And then experimentation goes back to government research academia for uh, testing things out, developing protocols, algorithms, things such as uh, development of security protocols and procedures for Internet of Things devices entering into a network uh, without a, without identifying the type of of device or make and model of the device. Uh, sometimes you say, well, of course you want to know the make and model of the device, but you don't necessarily have to. If you have a a table of some kind that is associated with that device, it's been authenticated on uh, with the with the security table, and it sends a Class E IP address to the uh, to the server and the server picks up that oh okay i don't know what this device is but this device has a ip address that's valid for entering our network then that that device can be uh, accepted onto the network without even knowing whether it's a tv a refrigerator a coffee pot whatever So private addresses are like your internal organizations, like here at Savannah Tech, inside the Savannah Tech uh, network, uh, that, that is all IP addresses. Uh, public IP addresses require registration and a fee for each address, but private addressing schemes eliminates the need to purchase that for every group of machines. So uh, public is out there floating around. You'll have a, as you can see, there, see down there in the chart, uh, you got private IP address ranges. Sometimes if you pull up your own computer or you look on your home internet or things like that, you'll see the ranges, you'll see these network addresses uh, with, the, with the associated subnet masks that opens up the ability for uh, you to even expand inside of your own home network. So subnetting will allow you to break down the parts of your network that's being used. You can uh, specialize 
your network. You can segment it. You can have activities taking place in one part of the network that doesn't uh, need to be known or identified by members of another. Um, this just allows you to uh, establish defensive measures as well that uh, can potentially keep a threat group or a threat actor from getting uh, too deep into your overall network. And so there's a lot of benefits uh, for organizational efficiency as well as defensive posture uh, when it comes to subnetting. So as you see there, you can have all users with a similar, you know, security and access need grouped together, and then you can you can manage that entire group instead of managing each uh, user separately. And between this class and um, 1602, if you guys haven't taken it or are going to take it, you'll you'll get a more of an understanding of managing user uh, accounts. I think the lab coming up will associate that for this particular review. So where it says in part three here that uh, subnetting borrowed bits from host portion of IP address uh, that goes uh, associated to like the host, like I said, uh, your desktop computer or your phone if it's connected to the network. Those IP addresses subnetting borrows bits from the host portion of the IP address, and then the number of borrowed bits determines how many subnets and hosts are available. So then we go back to the classes of networks. So we say here up to 14 bits can be borrowed for a class network. This is what a uh, network engineer or an IT staff or even a security team wants to understand uh, one of the many things, of course, that they want to understand about their organizational network so they can identify the potential uh, vectors and levels of uh, awareness that they have to have for uh, mitigating uh, intrusion as well as monitoring outflow. So there's a good chart to understand some of the what's he talking about might be going through somebody's mind. And so if you're using, you know, the subnet 255.255.128.0, you can only have uh, two subnetworks. Now, two may not sound like a lot, but usable host per subnet gives you 32,766 hosts uh, per subnet. So that's technically over 35,000 hosts. So two subnetworks, uh, as you can see, in just one company gives you the ability to have uh, 65,000 hosts. So you can have 65,000 devices from servers to desktops to tablets to whatever. And then that carries you on through as you see your subnet uh, blows out down to the bottom of a full 25555. Uh, 252 ending, which if you notice that there, it ends at that 252, there's been two things borrowed from it, as previously mentioned. So where you're, uh, or excuse me, you have, a, you can't take a full value away from the 255, the last 255. Part of it is associated with the two that is borrowed, as well as uh, the one that the control is being done through. So that's where the other three numbers are at. But when you run the subnet out to 252, you can have 16,300 subnets. That's a lot, but only two hosts per subnet. There's some usability and something like that, but usually you're subnetting more in the uh, 224.0 area. So an organization breaks its overall structure down into eight subnets. 
and that there allows uh, allows it to have 81 90 as it says usable host per net so you multiply that 8190 by 8 and uh, that's what it carries you through But just to understand how this converts, you got your binary digits and your decimal equivalent. And so where it sits gives you uh, the value. So your 128 sits in the, in the eighth. First, if you're looking at it, eighth if you're coming from the right to the left. And then everything doubles down basically 128 down to 64 to 32 16 8 4 2 1 so you see here on the sub uh, on the subnet address 199.1.10.0, you have a range from 10.1 to 10.30. And so that is, you, you can have a host, a computer, a phone, whatever it may be, a server stack. You can have is that 29 of them connected there. Your broadcast address, that subnet is 10.31. So for whatever reason, an organization, business, whatever it may be, doesn't have a um, large number of available IP addresses, you can actually create subnets within subnets. And this gets us to the variable link subnet masking. So as with anything in the world, we can figure out how to manipulate it and adjust it to give us additional um, usability and viability, but at the same time, what we can figure out how to do to give us greater use of a capability. Uh, there's a threat actor or a threat group out there somewhere that's also learning, understanding, or has identified a way to use that same uh, knowledge for nefarious activities. So we talked about the multicasting. So unicast transmission is where we have one packet that's sent from one server to each client computer individually. So that's a server uh, or one packet goes from the server in the server room to each computer, each cell phone, each tablet, whatever it may be. Multicast transmission, the server can treat several computers as a group and send one, send one transmission that reaches all of them i.e. streaming video presentation. So, um, you know, the product design team has a video that they need uh, sent out. Uh, the server can send it to just the computers that are in the product design group. Broadcast transmission is sent to all nodes on a specific network. Flooded broadcasts are sent to any subnet and directed broadcast can be sent to a specific subnet. So again, you can still control 
who gets the data uh, that is needed for whatever the intended output is or outcome is. So we'll talk a little bit more about IPv or Internet Protocol version 4. IP datagrams. The protocol is brought IPv4 as well as all of the protocols are broken out into different uh, datagrams or uh, areas of information. And so you have the portion of the packet that's responsible for routing through the network. So the packet, the overall data is a packet and that packet carries all of its DNA per se with it as it moves forward. And so the packet has information at different locations and the header, the footer and so forth that tells the stack where it needs to go and what its processes should be. The uh, IPv4 protocol is processed at the network layer, but is facilitated through all of the other layers. And we'll see some of that uh, later. So where is it going? How does it need to be handled? And what's the actual information in it is part of a packet. Now, the interesting thing about the packet is that the packet isn't all of the data. So for example, when you send an email, uh, when you send a picture through your phone, when you send any, any type of large uh, transmission, it's broke down into packets. And so the those packets don't all go out in a straight line. Uh, one right after the other, like a train on the internet. The packets go out and they get to where they need to go by the most efficient, least resistant method possible. That's facilitated by the information that's in the packet. And so eventually uh, all the pieces of that transmission come back together where they need to be uh, so they can be rendered for whatever it is that, that they're supposed to be presenting, whether it's a picture, whether it's an email, uh, whether it's a video file, uh, it all is broken down. And uh, the header, the data, as you see there, some packets have a footer or a trailer it indicates the end of the packet or error checking. Uh, and that's an example of when all the packets come together, the, footer the footers will tell it when tell it or the application that receives it when it's received all of its needed components. If you've ever seen something where it says the data is corrupted or this, this file may be corrupted, it's potentially because one of the packets or content associated with the packet did not render correctly or did not come together uh, during transmission. So the IP header structure, the significance of needing to understand some things like this is that threat actors who also understand the components here are able to manipulate and uh, control uh, activities into a network based on the, the aspects of things that they can manipulate. So an example here, which we'll go talk a little bit, uh, the header, the footer, the parts of the IPv4 of the packet, part of an IP packet uh, that the computer is to communicate and the fields that are part of it um, can be manipulated. So as you see here, the IP header structure, you see at the top, you got the headers, the services, the total length, identification, any flags, uh, the header checksum. We'll talk more about that later. That's got to do with hash values, the protocols associated with it, the source IP address. So uh, an example here, if you intercepted this packet, you would be able to see which IP address it came from and actually where it's going. Uh, all of that type of uh, metadata or DNA of the packet exists, but the data, the payload is carrying is down here. And so the part of the overall product that is trying to be delivered, such as an email picture, whatever, is being carried in the data. 
the information in the header, then when it comes back, when all the packets come back together, they all sync up based on complementary header structure. They close out based on footer uh, conclusion. And that's then in something like Gmail, how the email is then rendered in its proper format because it identified that all the pieces were put back together correctly. Um, this is also, this is just very generic. So there's some, there's some other, other examples that are much more clear, but they, well, threat actors for different reasons, understanding the use of different components of this can intercept the packet, manipulate some of the data in the packet, attach additional payload to that packet, send it, release it back on with its associative packets. And that's an example of how uh, malware, ransomware, what, whatever type of, uh, of incursion uh, a threat actor is trying to do can be done uh, with unsecure IPv4. So Wireshark, we'll go over, uh, make sure you guys have information about this before we leave and figure out to get you some uh, hands-on time with uh, Wireshark for your own benefit at home. But Wireshark is an example of a uh, NOS or network operating system. It allows you to watch and monitor packets as they're coming through. Example here, the IP header structure is seen in Wireshark and the packet capture. So this is where we're, pack, we're, we're, we're doing it. It's telling you here, we got an internet protocol. The header length is 20 bits. Uh, the differentiated services associated with it. Um, here, you see we got um, TCP. So here's your IP, here's your TCP. And here's the ports. This is the port that it's, it's, uh, it's flowing through. Um, you can't, let's see. Uh, yeah, so the source, let me see, do I have the ability to, I got a pencil here. Let's try and change this to red. So here you got the source and the destination. So the source is where this packet was coming from. The destination is where it's going. And I know that the TCP is on the port here. Now, this down here is where some of your data is at. And under certain circumstances, depending on how secure it is, you, you will see part of the message traffic actually show up down here. Um, but you can also see, it's not clear, but up here, you can see the source of the traffic. So now we know we're dealing with a Cisco uh, piece of hardware. That type of knowledge from a threat actor's view would potentially let me, excuse me, allow a threat actor to uh, perform some activities to try to get into the network. So we got ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, and so used to assist with troubleshooting communication problems. So we can do what's called a ping, and a ping command uses this ICMP to check whether a remote host has connectivity. So you can, uh, uh, from a server or even from one computer, you can reach out and ping a website. You can ping another computer. You can ping a server. Um, and so at the network layer of the OSI model is where you're able to do these pings. And that lets you know if a port is open or if a device is functioning, if it's active on a network, uh, network administrators, security managers, you know, firewalls, packet filters are configurable, you know, to allow or not allow the uh, the ping packets to get through the network. Anything that gets into your network or is attempted to be pushed into your network can cause uh, problems. So here's an example of some of the types. So we got an echo reply. This is just an address match request. So it tells you uh, the type here. Um, 
let's see. You can get a timestamp return. So if you, you send out a, a ICMP 13 request, uh, ICMP 38 is a domain name reply. Uh, what that means is it, it tells you who who uh, or what the name of the domain is that that device is operating on. Uh, and so any of these can be uh, used for good as well as bad, depending on the intent of the, the person. I think I jumped too far. So now, so the, we talked about headers before on the IPv4. Now we're talking about the TCP. This is a, a, a different protocol. And so this, the TCP headers are processed in the transport layer of the OSI model. The IPv4 is processed in the network layer of the OSI model. The TCP portion of the packet is a segment, and the flags section of that header uh, are important because you can uh, create certain rules or you can make traffic uh, accept certain rules when it's coming and going through the network. So we can see the source port, where it came from, where it's going. Uh, flags, you know, uh, what, what do we want it to do? And you'll learn more about this as we go along. But for example, the ACK here, this is an acknowledge, this means acknowledge. Uh, you got a fin for finish, you got a send for sync, so on and so forth. Um, the data though, as you see, the, overall you have this, this architecture inside the header, but the data is carried here. And so the ability to manipulate any of the areas um, up here may not have any intent to touch the data down here. So the user datagram protocol provides a transport service for the internet protocol. Again, process at the transport layer, but it's very unreliable because it doesn't have a, it's, a, it's what we call connectionless. The UDP packet does not contain a sequence or an acknowledgement number. Uh, which doesn't guarantee delivery. It's it's almost like you throw a um, throw a piece of mail at a mailbox, hoping that it might go in or land somewhere near it that someone could identify that it should have gone into a particular mailbox. Maybe not the best example, but an example of uh, it doesn't connect to that mailbox. So if you wanted to go into that mailbox, you would need to put the address of the mailbox. So for example, UDP is like sending a packet to a street and TCP allows you to get that data to an actual house on the street. So you see there's a much different structure in the UDP versus the TCP. There's a lot of stuff missing. It's got the source and the destination where you want it to go, but it doesn't have a lot of specific guidance on how to get it there. So packet fragmentation overall, as I mentioned earlier, a, a overall data set does not go out in full combination. It goes out with uh, pieces broken down to navigate through the internet, through the through a network uh, the most efficiently as possible, and are then reconfigured at its end state, goal, objective, point, position, whatever it may be, uh, in order to be rendered for use in whatever its particular format was. So as you see, originally developed to allow large packets to pass through routers with frame size limitations. A lot of limitations in design and development in the past. Uh, a lot of things have changed. We got a lot, a lot much faster. Excuse me, a lot faster and much more uh, advanced routers and capabilities. 
but the routers divide the packets into smaller fragments and send them along the network uh, on the most efficient paths possible. And our you know, standardly, standardly, as a standard, we know you break those things down into about eight bits, and they carry enough stuff to uh, get through and then be re and then be combined back together uh, for rendering. Port numbers appear only in fragment zero. So you see here the security problems that exist. Uh, fragments one and higher pass through filters without being scrutinized. So an attacker can modify the IP header to make all fragment numbers start with one or higher. And so that's a very simple uh, understanding of how a threat actor would get something through. So I would say for the sake of the lesson, definitely you know, make a note of that because you yellow on this one. I'm sure I get a fatter pencil. All I got is a pencil. Um, yeah, but here is an emphasis there. So the TCP lifecycle and what's called the three-way handshake should have uh, should go over that in your material. But you've got host A sends an initial sequence number in the first packet to host B. So this is called a send packet or a sync packet, if that helps you understand it better. When host B receives a send packet, it responds with a send acknowledged, ACK is acknowledged, with an initial sequence number for the host B. And so that includes an acknowledgement number that is one more than the initial sequence number. So then host A sends an ACK packet to host B, an acknowledge packet, uh, and increases the host B sequence number by one. So it's a three-way handshake, as you see here. TCP three-way handshake send, right? Here's the source port, the desk that's going to port 80. Here's a sequence number, acknowledgement number, and it's got a send flag. As we get down, you see here's the uh, source port. So now it's being sent back from host B from port 80 to destination force with a sequence number here, acknowledgement number one higher than the sequence number, right? With your send acknowledge. And so one higher, one higher. Source again here. And then acknowledgement number again, one number higher here for the uh, final acceptance of the handshake. If I see that, I just want to jump back and forth. So we're looking here. You got your final acknowledgement. This is our sequence numbers. This is where we're, we're validating a change. We're watching things flow. And so as we back up, we see here 88. It acknowledged, the acknowledgement number goes up to 89. The sequence number here is ends in 95. Right. And then Final acknowledgement takes us up to 9.6. So we had a balanced, efficient handshake. So the sliding window size will determine the number of packets that can be sent before the acknowledgements must be received. The sender controls the size of that sliding window. So this is an area where, uh, depending on how vulnerable your Sliding window is for uh, engagement. Might be another location where a threat actor can uh, get into a packet for manipulation. Your fin flag, FIN, is when either side is ready to send, or excuse me, to end the session. So the station that receives the initial flag sends a response packet with the ACK and its own fin flag set to acknowledge receipt and to show it's ready to end the session. Okay. So overall, one, 
connection request. So host A wants to talk to host B. So they send a request to sync. B acknowledges a request to sync, sends it back to two. Three then, sent, then acknowledges its acknowledgement. And based on that, host A then starts to send the first data frame which has the same sequence number and ACK as the third packet of the three-way handshake. That way it is following uh, the secure connection between the three-way handshake. So your DNS, your domain name service, this is, as I said earlier, translates fully qualified domain names into IP addresses. Again, fully qualified domain names. Uh, it can be used to block unwanted communication. So DNS is where, uh, from a defense posture, you would block anything that's a .xxx uh, domain or a dot, I don't know, any domain that's associated with shopping uh, as a group or what have you. But uh, whatever type of communication you do not want uh, into a network, you can block with your firewall, depending on what type you have, uh, that set of that that set of domains from uh, or that classification of domains. It's just a whole other class on explaining just how great technology is at being able to help with some of those things. Uh, but now, the bad guy side to this is the DNS attack option. So what happens is you have potentially three main ones. There are more. But classics are buffer overflow, zone transfer, and cache poisoning. Hmm. Didn't take us through those. So buffer overflow, if you think about a buffer inside the system think of it like a, a bucket big opening on the top with a small let's say hose or tube coming out the bottom and so a steady stream is going of data but the buffer allows uh, data to be stored uh, for short term while uh, everything is still processing and with a buffer overflow more data then can be held in that bucket is sent to a server and so that calls a buffer overflow and that is a dns attack because it basically sends more data than uh, can be held and it just spills over uh, zone transfer moves uh, data to where it's not supposed to be and cache poisoning, if you've ever gone to like Google uh, or anything like that, uh, sometimes you can pull data up from the past from the cache uh, that's sitting uh, on your computer or on a server. You're not really pulling it from the live internet. And so uh, the fact that data can be stored in, in that manner uh, from cache, uh, poisoning can be done. Threat actors can do uh, poisoning of the cache to facilitate getting you to go to places or getting things into, go to places you don't want to go or getting things into your system that you do not want there. So going into uh, IPv6, as you see here, IPv6 has a larger address space. It's got 128 bits. Um, and if you break that out, that is just an astronomical amount of uh, IP possibilities. It was like IPv4, you know, thought wouldn't run out for a couple of hundred years, even though um, we didn't think about how productive we would be in developing devices that would need those IP addresses. IPv6 was kind of looked at and the exponential growth across 128 bits truly puts it at the potential of not running out of IP addresses for like tens of thousands of years. So that's a whole other interesting discussion for those that are that, that want to break it out beyond just basics. 
So IPv6 though, as opposed to IPv4, has an integrated support for security. It's called IPsec, IPsec. Uh, so network address translation is not needed in uh, IPv6 based on IPsec uh, because that NAT in IPv4, of course, has security problems, which is part of things that threat actors are able to manipulate. IPv6 uh, systems, networks, or, or uh, devices are able to determine their own settings based on whether it's a, they're a stateful auto configuration or a stateless configuration. IPv6 is connectionless. Uh, it has a uh, version 6 header and a payload. The header has version 6 base header and optional extension headers. So there's more uh, things that you can do that you can add to it, which uh, some might believe is a negative, and it could be, but also the benefit there is that it gives you the ability to increase security and control uh, of uh, the data and what type of class and, and, and uh, integration that the data is having, what's coming into your network, where it's coming from, where it's going, how it's going to be used. A big uh, support there for IPv6 or a big benefit gets down here mainly to uh, authentication and encapsulating security payload. This is uh, something that doesn't exist in IPv4, so you are able to carry a greater, de a greater degree of security and confidence in uh, IPv6 usage in the future. And as things grow, uh, IPv6 capabilities will end up you know, translating into everything. It's likely that IPv4 will stop being used and even IPv4 addresses, you know, will translate over to sixes. I'm not really sure where four will go overall, um, but eventually, especially where security is needed, uh, authentication and this ESP capability on version six is highly desirable. So you just got a few message types. Type two, the packet's too big. Three, it took too long to go through. There's a problem with the structure of the parameters. 128, 129 gives you an echo request and reply. So that's where not a ping, but you reach out to, to touch another uh, computer on the network um, with a 128. And if it's there, it's open, it's available to, to, be, to, uh, to talk to you or to, to engage with you, you're going to get a 129 uh, response back. So we talked about multicast earlier, uh, the different things. But here, uh, multicast listener discovery and MLD. So internet group message protocol of the past, uh, telling you know the, the streaming traffic where it goes, is replaced with uh, MLD. So in IPv4, uh, you could have what was called a, an ARP attack or ARP poisoning. Well, neighbor discovery replaces that. And so uh, some of the issues that threat actors are able to do with IPv4 addresses is uh, mitigated through the network discovery uh, feature in IPv6. So in IPv6, multicast are connect connectionless. They have a single stream on any link instead of one stream per recipient.
IP multicast traffic is sent to a single address, but is processed by all members of a multicast group. Hosts listening on a specific multicast address are part of the multicast group. Members can be on different subnets, whereas the, uh, before we talked about uh, you can you can send two group members in a subnet, but IPv6 allows you to uh, multicast across subnets. So as we see here, the addressing itself, 128 bits long, using hexadecimal, not just numbers, um, gives you an example down there in the middle of the screen of an IPv6 address that looks like this. So where in IPv4, you might have even leading zeros as part of the, the sequence here, uh, you don't need them. So where, where you've got zeros here, see, you only just need the zero here for that segment. And as it says, you can then replace consecutive zeros with a colon. So unicasting in IPv6 is kind of uh, takes the place of the, the private IPv4 addresses within a, a local site. <clears throat> and unicast addressing is how inside of a, a small network using IPv6 um, hosts on the same network communicate. So, you know, a computer on the Savannah Tech network, if it's running IPv6 protocol, um, it's talking to any other device, phone, what have you, that's, that's out there. So multicast is a one to many. Always begins with FF in the first byte. So again, we're talking hexadecimal for IPv6. Any cast addresses. They're created automatically when a unicast address is assigned to more than one interface. Offers flexibility in providing services. Currently only used by routers, but will expand as technology becomes widespread. So the routers, think about multicasting and routers, you know, control the traffic, send things out, determine what data needs to go where. Uh, but as you know, technology, as it says here, as, as uh, technology becomes more widespread, the ability for multicast addressing to transition to uh, systems in cars, potentially even Internet of Things devices, will um, increase, will likely as well. So Microsoft's operating systems since the XP Service Pack 1 have been uh, built for IPv6 support, even though we haven't needed to use it since then, like on a large scale. So here, uh, IPv6 utilities, this shows a configuration detail. If you do an IP config, some of you may know about that, but if you go down here to, I guess I'm not sharing, but you go down to the, uh, the start menu in the command area, you type in IP config, and it's going to bring this back to you. I'm not sure if I can share screen versus, no. Um, 
but you guys can do this. If you go down to the to the Windows icon, you click on that, you, you do an IP config, it's going to bring you back your IPv4 <clears throat> uh, and your IPv6 equivalent address, right? And now your global address, so think here, your global address is what's seen outside of your organization. So this IPv6 address you see here, link local address. Remember, it starts with different characters. Netstat displays the routing tables used by the command. Current sessions with associated port numbers. The value and the benefit here is that you, you need to know which ports are running, uh, operating open, uh, maybe uh, accessible on your network because that will give you an idea of where the doorways are uh, for threat actors to get into your system. Uh, your PS here, IPv6 option displays detailed statistics on the uh, version 6 activity since the last boot. So if you uh, shut down, if you just went to sleep, if you were hibernated, um, activity associated with IPv6 is still being uh, logged and can be pulled up with the netstat ps command. Uh, if you shut down and reboot, the netstat ps is only going to bring you up those details from the last boot. So on Windows systems, uh, it's different on others. They have them for Linux and Mac, but you know, predominantly we're talking about Windows. Uh, but the uh, net sh it's a command line scripting tool for Windows that allows troubleshooting configuration of network interfaces. So predominantly uh, a member of a, a, of a network administration team, but also uh, those of you that will work on a security team in the future uh, might want to get some additional practice uh, in your life on using the net sh uh, scripting tool because it will allow troubleshooting configuration of network interfaces i mean where what is talking to what how are thing how is data being transmitted and uh, with some more practice on that you can uh, have a better ability to control uh, some uh, some traffic activity as well as make sure that there's a security posturing that is best for your organization. So in summary for our TCP IP, uh, we have a suite of protocols for transmitting information. The uh, TCP and UDP map to the transport layer, IPv4, 6 ICMP, and the version 6 map to the network layer, the OSI model. IP address most common IP addresses most commonly used on the internet conform to version 4. You must understand the normal configuration of fields in these different protocols, IP, TCP, UDP headers to recognize and filter unwanted or malicious traffic. So again, I'll say as earlier, the biggest takeaway from this block is going to be that you understand that the information that exists in the headers, the footers, and the way packets talk to each other will be beneficial to identify malicious traffic trying to get into your network or that is already in your network uh, that can be um, quarantined or uh, moved to a demilitarized zone, which we'll talk about later, in order to control uh, how bad the threat may be on your system. So fragmentation of IP packets, internet protocol packets allows large packets to pass through routers with frame size limits, uh, but it's also overall a way to uh, efficiently move data around the internet. Three-way handshakes establish the connection between two points so that the data can be uh, carried from one to the other uh, with as much security as possible. IPv6 has uh, integrated design features to compensate for the problems that weren't identifiable in the development of IPv4. 
Six is a connectionless, unreliable protocol used mainly for addressing and routing packets. However, it has a increased capability to integrate security measures for the packets that it's associated with. So uh, MLD allows for discovering a multicast. Uh, to me, version six using uh, network discovery is a huge benefit because as you'll learn as we go through this class and others, you know, tasks that the ARP and uh, these other protocols do on IPv4 can lead to threat actor uh, manipulation, ARP poisoning, uh, ARP man manipulation. Version six has a very robust hexadecimal numbering format that, believe it or not, does make it uh, managing the addresses a lot better. Uh, you can monitor and configure version six using tools such as IP config, NetStat, and NetSH. So that's the review uh, for the class for this week. I uh, hope you guys will take time to uh, go over the uh, this, this uh, summary. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, of course, and I'll be here uh, with other data as I can send it and files that I can find it and cool little nuggets of information as uh, as needed.